So the last video used math a lot and I'm sure some of you were like, what the hell just happened? One minute it was just numbers and the next minute it was a complete texture. To many of you the technical side of things is not important and you just want some useful tools to create your next artwork. In this case you can just follow the video step by step to recreate the texture and put it in your library. But if you're like me, then the technical side is just as fun as the art side. And it's important to understand the math in order to invent new textures as well as improve the existing ones. So this video is for you, my technical artist. The first thing you must understand is the term value. A lot of the time I use the term value instead of black, white or grey. This is because the black, grey and white are just different level of brightness of the pixels on your screen. And this brightness is defined by a number or a value. And so instead of calling it brightness, a lot of artists out there, including myself, call it value. In Blender, it is the V channel of the HSV color picker. Also, some other program call it HSB, with B stands for brightness. On the screen, the value 0 represent black and 1 represents white. Any value above 1 will be the same white and anything below 0 will be the same black. In Photoshop, even though the white value is 255, internally it is still 1, so that the multiply and divide color blend mode still work properly. This is why the multiply blend mode always make the result darker. With the modern color management systems, Blender's Filmic for example, the color can be much higher than 1 before appearing as white. But that is just for the screen. When we deal with the materials, if a surface has a color brighter than 1, the light will gain energy as it bounces off the surface. Obviously it's wrong, so we typically deal with brightness within the range 0 and 1. However, the value only becomes the brightness when we try to visualize it by putting it in the color input of the shader. If we use the value for some other purpose, displacement for example, then it is just a value, the brightness no longer means anything. In this case the value can be anything we want and it can be negative, it can be thousands, whatever, and we can use different math operations to manipulate the values to serve our purpose. The next thing to understand is the texture coordinate system. This is a two dimensions Cartesian coordinate system. We have the x axis and the y axis, and every point on this space is defined by a set of two values, x and y. In Blender, this is the UV space. A model is unwrapped and placed somewhere in this space. We can place it anywhere but usually within the 0 to 1 range for both axes. So while rendering a model, when a ray of light, or camera ray for that matter, hits a certain point on the surface, Blender will find where this point is located in the UV space and return the coordinate in the form of a pair of X and Y values. And a bunch of light rays hit all the different points on the model what we get is a bunch of X and Y pairs, very similar to the ones next to it, just slightly different, and if we visualize this result, we get a nice and smooth gradient, and then we can separate the X and Y value to do some math on them. In this example, I changed Blender's color to the old sRGB management system. It is now called standard in the color management setting. With this setting, one will appear as white, otherwise it will appear as light grey. And I unwrapped this plane like this. This square is the 0 to 1 region of the UV space, and a big chunk of the plane is outside the standard area. So let's see what happens when we try to visualize this texture coordinate. As you can see, 
x values appear as red and y value appears as green. So the point where both x and y are equal or higher than 1, we get pure yellow. And down here, both x and y are less than 0, so it appears as black. And if we separate x and y values and visualize just one channel at a time, we get the standard black and white value with 0 being black and 1 being white. Let's hit F12 to render the picture. And on this corner, change the display channel to red. And now, when I click on the image, notice the RGB values down here, especially the R value. You can see that when I click here, the value is negative and it appears as black, even though it has a value. And if I click over here, the value is greater than 1 and it appears as pure white. Same thing goes for the green channel, which is the y-axis. We can use the value for whatever purpose we may have in mind. And in the last video, I use it to set the height for the displacement. In Blender, one unit means one meter. So when we put one to the displacement, it will move the vertices by one meter. If we set the mid-level to 0 0.5, then the value of one will move the vertices up by half a meter, and zero will move the vertices down by half a meter. And 0 0.5 will not move anything at all. So the range of 0 to 1 still displays a total range of 1 meter. The scale value is a multiplier to the total displacement. Basically the height subtract the mid-level then multiply the result by the scale to get the final displacement distance. Let's reset the UV of the plane so that it fits perfectly in the standard UV area. So if I put the x value of the UV in the displays, set the mid-level to 0 and scale to 1, I have a linear displacement from 0 to 1 meter. Now drop a math node and change the operation to multiply and adjust the second value. See what happens. Let's set it to 0 0.5. This node will multiply the x value of every point on this surface by 0 0.5 so 1 becomes 0 0.5, 0 0.7 becomes 0 0.35, and 0 0.5 becomes 0 0.25, and so on. This results in the displacement being lower by half a meter. And this math node is similar to changing the scale here, except that it is calculated before the mid-level, while the scale is calculated after the mid-level. The color ramp only works on value range from 0 to 1. Anything below 0 will be clamped to 0, and anything above 1 will be clamped to 1. And if you input a color, then the color will be converted to black and white values before it being used. So always make sure your value range from 0 to 1, otherwise you will lose some information. Now, the length of the ramp represents the range from 0 to 1 of the input. Each key of this ramp has a position, and this position is the original value of the input. And the color of the key is the new color of the original value. For example, I can add a key here, and if we select this key, you can see that the position is 0 0.5. This means that this key targets the value 0 0.5 and change it to something else. Right now the new color is still gray so nothing is changed. Now if we change the color of the key to something else, let's say red, you can see in the output the value 0 0.5 is changed to red. Now we can add as many keys as we need to change the input however we want. Since I plan to use this for displacement, I will not use any colors for the keys. I can target the value 1 and change it to 0, and target 0 0.5 and change it to 1. This will transform a 0 to 1 gradient into a different gradient, 
which range from 0 to 1 and back to 0. Before we displace the plane, let's subdivide it a couple of times. Now we have the geometry to displace. As you can see, the 0 to 1 to 0 gradient results in a displacement like this from 0 meter to 1 meter and then back to 0 meter. We can move the center key to change how we transform the original gradients and get a different displacement. We can even add more keys to the color ramp to further customize the displacement. The RGB curves node also works on value range from 0 to 1 but it expects colors instead of single values and it does not clamp your input so if you have values outside the range 0 to 1 you still get some results however it is very unpredictable here inside the node we have separate curves for the different channels of the color input and this C tab apply the same curve for all three channels the X dimension of the graph represents the original values of each channel with left being 0 and right being 1. The Y dimension of the graph represents the new value of each channel with 0 being the bottom and 1 being the top. And this curve here is the transformation of the old value to the new value. For example, I can bring this center point up like this and you can see the coordination of this point down here. X is 0 0.5 and Y is 0 0.75. This means that 0 0.5 is changed to 0 0.75. And the rest of the gradient is transformed according to this curve. For any X value, Blender will look up the Y value of this curve and spit out the result in this output. Now if we look back at the gradient used in the displacement, we can see that the displacement is straight. This is because the gradient is linear. The values distribute evenly from left to right. In order to curve the displacement, we need to transform the linear gradient to something else. The values should no longer distribute evenly from left to right. And this is where we have to use the RGB curve node. Using the curve node, we can transform the linear gradient to anything we want, and then use that result to displace the surface. Now we can also create some complex math operations to perfectly transform the linear gradient to something different. For example, I can make a perfectly circular displacement using these three math nodes. However, the curve node is still more artist friendly and it serves most of our needs. We only need to use math for some very rare cases where we need absolute precision. So in the last video, I created a round displacement by combining the color ramp and the curve node. The color ramp node transformed the linear gradient into two mirroring linear gradients. The left is 0 to 1 and the right is 1 to 0. Then the curve node transforms these mirroring gradients into two mirroring halves of a circle. Modulo is a very useful math operation. Sadly, it wasn't taught very well at school. My school at least. A modulo B is also called A mod B. It is the remainder of the A by B division. For example, 2.3 divide 2 equal 1 and the remainder is 0 0.3, right? So 0 0.3 is the result of 2.3 mod 2 operation. So the modulo math is particularly useful when we need to cut a linear gradient into multiple repeating gradients. Look at this gradient. It is currently in the range of 0 to 1. So let's multiply it by 4. Now the gradient is in the range of 0 to 4. And see what happens if we mod it by 2. We now have two identical gradients, each range from 0 to 2. For every point on this surface, Blender will get the value 
and mod it by 2, which result in a value somewhere in the range from 0 to 2. Let's mod it by 1. Now we have 4 gradients range from 0 to 1. At this position, the input is 1, so 1 mod 1 equals 0. And here, the input is 2, so 2 mod 1 equals 0 again. And here is 3 mod 1 equals 0 again. So you can see when the value of the input increase to infinity, we have an infinite repeating 0 to 1 gradient. So now we combine the knowledge so far to create something useful. We can multiply the gradient by 4 and then modulate by 1 to get these repeating gradients. Then use a color ramp node to transform each gradient into a pair of mirroring linear gradients. And then use a curve node to transform it into a round gradient. And finally use the result value to displace the mesh. In order to have a gap in between the waves, we need to add another color ramp node and drag the black key to the right a bit. So with a bunch of linear gradients like this, each gradient will get the same treatment, which results in a dark gap between each repeat. And there you have it, a gap in between the waves. Now the idea of the fabric texture is quite simple. First we create a set of straight threads, and then we push the threads up and down like this. But instead of pushing evenly for every row, the push for every alternate row is moved by 0.5 units to the left. And then we redo the entire process, but perpendicular to the previous. And then we move one of the two until the waves align and we're done. So if you rewatch my last video, you can see that to the point where I made the first node group, that was to create the thread. And the part after that is to make the push up and down for the thread. And the part after I made the second node group is the combining of the two sets of threads using a maximum math node, which compare the two value input and spit out the greater one. Now that you have the knowledge, you can go back and rewatch the last video to see the knowledge in action. I'll put the link in the description. There are a few minor math tricks that are not in this video, mostly in the creation of the push up and down, but this video is already long enough and those tricks are simple, so with a bit of thinking I think you can figure out what they mean.